I've noted that uh, Matthew Vine's book, God and the Gay Christian, has had a, 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 quite a sizable impact, and I'm aware of how the youth have responded to this. So I purchased a copy of the book, and I went through it very carefully, underlining and highlighting as I went. And then I condensed all his arguments down into a series of arguments, syllogisms actually. If you can condense an argument down into a syllogism, uh, it's a good exercise because it forces you to see what are the propositions and what is the logical conclusion. And uh, so I've spoken on this a number of times. Uh, the time constraints here mean we do not cover all of his arguments. So I've just picked out what I think are his best arguments, the ones that maybe can be the most compelling. And every uh, there are notes, and that's the link to the notes down there. These notes are um, a little more extensive, and they will cover all the arguments, not just the ones I show here. And there's a little more explanation going with those notes. So I'd recommend that. Uh, probably not a whole lot of need to write anything down unless you don't want to download the notes. So let's begin. I want to just define a few terms that some people are a bit unclear on. Affirming, Matthew Vine defines as uh, you agree with and support committed monogamous same-sex relationships. If you see anything in quotes here, that's directly from Matthew Vine. And uh, so if you're non-affirming, which you see that phrase he used a lot, that means you do not agree with and support committed monogamous same-sex relationships. Sexual orientation is the natural as opposed to learned or acquired direction of sexual attraction when experiences that a person is incapable of changing. Am I supposed to be speaking of that mic? Is that important? Okay. Okay. Um, I'll harness myself to this. Gender identity is a person's mental sense of which gender they identify themselves with. And transgender is a person whose gender identity is the opposite of their biological gender. Uh, now, in, in uh, Ontario here, in the sex ed curriculum portion, uh, they wouldn't refer to biological gender. They would refer to a birth assigned gender, a gender that you're assigned at birth. So with those definitions out of the way, let's get into his first argument, and I call it the sexual orientation argument. And uh, he does some, he presents some research from various places. In ancient Greece, uh, same-sex relationships were usually described as, uh, well, fall into the category of pederasty, men with boys or older boys with younger boys, and that would be from around 400 BC. Rome, uh, Seneca in the first century AD, uh, mentions same-sex relations with slaves. Cato the Elder, second century BC, same-sex prostitution. Second millennium, millennium BC Egypt, raping the conquered. So the victorious soldiers would rape the conquered, especially the higher ranking ones, to humiliate them. And then in the Epic of Gilgamesh, King used both men and women for his voracious sexual appetite. So the point that he makes here is that same-sex behavior in ancient times usually was a diversion and a choice practiced by men who had a heterosexual sexual orientation. Uh, and he suggests here that sexual orientation was not known in ancient times, which is a very key aspect to his argument. So with that in mind, uh, let's condense his argument down, which is, I'm taking a lot of pages and contending it down. So his first proposition is that same-sex orientation was unknown in ancient times. Now, if one is the case, then references in the Bible do not address same-sex as an orientation. Just the other kinds of sex talked about that we saw there. Just talks about those things, but not sexual orientation. Therefore, it logically follows, uh, argues Vine, that new information on same-sex orientation requires us to reinterpret scripture on either same-sex behavior or celibacy, no matter what stance we take on same-sex relationships. So if you oppose, if you're not affirming, then you will have to readjust this traditional definition of celibacy to include same-sex relationships. Uh, we'll go into the celibacy argument shortly. Uh, realizing the short amount of time, I normally like to say, you know, here's the syllogism, do you, how do you feel about the argument? But no, just stick the fire hose in your mouth and keep drinking. Uh, here's some problems that I see with that argument. Number one, it's very difficult to construct Hebrew society's view of same-sex relationships from single snapshots taken from other cultures and times. You'll notice they had quite a spread. First, uh, if, if uh, Moses, this is rough, roughly 1,400 uh, years before Christ, uh, where Moses was at Mount Sinai, then you are in 400 BC, you're talking about something 1,000 years later in a different culture. 
uh, same with that Roman one. Egypt is a little bit closer, Gilgamesh, um, before that. But even if you were doing an archaeological dig today, and, or not today, let's say uh, North America got buried under something, and about uh, 3,000 years from now they're doing a dig and they find a piece of paper and it has something to do with sex on it, and then they extrapolated this was Canada's view of sex. This is how sex went on uh, over a period of thousands of years back in the time of, well, you know, even in a period of 100 years things have changed in Canada. And still, even now, a single piece of paper with something about sex on it would be very dangerous to extrapolate that to the whole society or conclude that because it didn't mention this over here, that therefore they didn't know about that type of thing. Very, very sketchy uh, to make that move. But more than that, more than that, it assumes that the Bible was written, there's one of two other assumptions that come in here. It assumes that the Bible is written just by men, or by men who were limited by their own knowledge at the time. So when Moses gave the commands at Mount Sinai, he was giving them within the context of his own knowledge at the time, and saying, don't do this. Uh, but if you are a Christian, um, and your belief is that the Bible was just written by people who wrote about what they happened to know about at the time, that's going to be a serious problem because as a believer, I have to reach a point in my life where I not only put my faith in Christ, but I put my faith in the Bible. Even if I might not want to agree with some of it, I have to say, well, that's what it says, and so I better figure out why it says that. Um, now, if you take the view that the Bible was divinely inspired, then it raises a different problem, and the problem is that if it's inspired by God, then it assumes that God didn't know about sexual orientation when he says don't do this or don't have this sort of sex or don't, for men don't lie with a man as you would with a woman. So I see all, there's three problems here, and that is uh, uh, laid out as follows, but because of the shortness of the seminar, I'm just going to move on. And uh, let's look at the argument from celibacy as a chosen gift. His argument from celibacy can be summarized. He's got actually two arguments. We'll only look at one. Proposition number one, celibacy is a gift that should be freely chosen, not imposed. Many gay men and LGBT find uh, celibacy to cause them grave damage and deeply destructive. And he outlines what he means by that. Some even commit suicide as a result of non-affirming people. Therefore, imposed celibacy is not an option for LGBT people. That is, uh, for the believer, he believes, for within the context of Christianity, and, and I should say that Matthew Vine would describe himself as a conservative evangelical Christian. So he's saying within the context of, a, of conservative evangelical Christianity, uh, non-affirmation of LGBTQ people should not be an option. They should be permitted to not be celibate if they so choose. Because enforcing celibacy really causes harm. So I see a couple of problems here. Um, and the first is a, a form in the form of a question. Might Vine's portrayal of celibacy be a little too narrow? What about singles, for example, who form a much greater percentage than gays within those who wish to follow Christ? So I know some single people who are now in their 50s and their 60s. Now you can say to the single people, don't worry, you can at least have the option of getting married someday and see what sex is all about. But that gets a little old as you move into your 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, one of my <coughs> closest friends is now in his 60s. Really nice guy. I don't know why all the women have not <laughs> lined up. Uh, just such a nice guy. But, and I know that he has been interested, but he's very shy. So, so goes his life. And these people have chosen celibacy not because they see it's a gift from God. No. Many of them have probably spent many times of tears, wondering and being lonely and whatever, but they have chosen celibacy not because it was a gift, but because it was the morally right thing to do under the context of Christianity. And these are just heterosexual singles. And so um, this, this, uh, there's a lot more I could have said about this, but I think the, going back to his argument here, um, right there, uh, celibacy should be a gift that's freely chosen, not imposed, um, really is, I'd, I'd say there's a problem with that particular proposition. That uh, for most people who want to follow Christ but find themselves not married, it's, um, 
it, it's something they do freely choose for moral reasons, but it's not, a, it's not what they would regard as a gift, a spiritual gift from God. How about the God made me this way argument? Um, Vine's argument, he states, uh, creation is good, the body is good, sexuality is a core part of the body, is also good. And this is one of the most common arguments I see within uh, the youth that I en engage with. Uh, so let's summarize this argument. Let's form it into a syllogism here. Proposition number one, God made the body good. Our sexuality <laughs> is part of the body. Sexuality including your orientation, your desires, whatever that's in, that's in this package of sexuality. God made that as part of the body. God made the body good. Therefore, it logically follows that our sexuality is from God and it is good. In other words, um, if you find yourself same-sex attracted, then that God made you that way. And that's usually the way it's summarized often in uh, people that where I read their views on this. Um, there's something, though, that's problematic about this approach when you actually read what the scriptures have to say about human sexuality. And that is you cannot simply assume that your sexuality is good, that there's no problems with it. C.S. Lewis really puts this vividly in Mere Christianity. And I don't have time to read his quote, but it really underscores this idea of people, what would you think of a civilization who spent hours and hours just or in this case, it was a striptease joint where it was a roast uh, beef or something uh, on a plate with a napkin over it. And as the music played, you slowly lifted the napkin. There's crowds of people just all around it. And you look at it, they must be starving, he would say. But then you look at the people, no, they're not. They look well fed. Why are they so obsessed with watching this? Same question could be asked today. Why do pe people spend so much time watching porn on the Internet? And something has gone terribly wrong with our sexuality, argues C.S. Lewis, but it's not just C.S. Lewis. I always evaluate what C.S. Lewis says. I like him. But I evaluate what he says in light of what I see in the scriptures, and here's what I see. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not a nussel passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. Now, there's a couple of things I just want to point out here. Sanctification, this idea of sort of making us living a life that is holy. There's one aspect that you are already sanctified, you're already holy in the sight of God because of what Christ has done for you, if you have put your faith in Christ and, and received him. But there's another aspect that he wants you to bring your life into line. Now, when I, I was struck uh, a while back, a few years ago when I read this, I was like, oh, that is, of course, that's an italics, it's not an original, but the idea that you, so I said, oh, I'm excited here. What's the main, first thing I need to do? in order to live a life that's holy. And to my amazement, it didn't say go to church every Sunday or eat broccoli. It just said, <laughs> abstain from sexual immorality. Of all the things God could have said, he starts with that. And he just doesn't say it as a phrase. He then goes on to expand on it, and it's even more than what I've written here. So I thought, this must be, this is interesting. It suggests that humanity is a Achilles heel. One of our Achilles heels is our sexuality. And there's this tendency to uh, engage in that there's something gone wrong with it. And so we need to bring it into line with living a holy life. And if you want to know uh, how not to live, he gives us an example here. Not like the Gentiles who do not know God. Now in Thessalonica, there were believing Gentiles. And he, he doesn't say not like the Gentiles. He just says not like the Gentiles who don't know God. So what he's saying is, he's, I'll give you a helpful example of how not to live. Take a look out the window. Take a look at society. Look at TV. Look at uh, what's on YouTube and, and what's in the media. That's how not to live, basically, when you have a society that does not know God. And that ought to cause us as Christians some sober second thoughts when we're analyzing our own sexuality and going along with what society is saying, is that we may actually be crossing a line here. Um, what does God say? Oh, I, I put this way. I says, what does I am say? Because Tony Campolo, I was reading an article that he wrote, and he says, when people ask me, what does God say about same-sex relationships? He says, I ask them, well, what did Jesus say about it? And the idea is that if you go through all the letters written in red in your four Gospels, you won't find anything about him saying anything about same-sex relationships. And then he makes the point, well, if Jesus didn't feel, feel it was important enough to say anything about, then uh, why should you be so concerned about it? 
But uh, if you will read the, what Jesus said about different things in the Gospels, you note that on several occasions he referred to himself as I am. And the people knew what he was saying when he said I am. He was the, claiming to be the same person who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. He, he claimed to be the person at Mount Sinai. And if that's the case, the moment that Jesus says I am, then you see that he actually had a great deal to say about sexual morality. Enormous amount throughout the scriptures. Here's one thing he says. And I would say, Paul doesn't, people say Paul said this and that. I actually prefer to say the Holy Spirit said through Paul. And if the Holy Spirit didn't say that through Paul, Paul actually says, I say this, not God. But in this case, he says, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Now, this is interesting, being corrupted. Now, right now, as I speak, there is a dead groundhog between my house and Elmira. It's been there for more than a week. And if you get out of the car and, and look at it closely and stand downwind, you get an idea of what this word being corrupted means. And this is the same descriptive word being used here. He's saying we have a problem, and we have this idea that there's a part of us, the way we naturally are, the, the natural person or the old self, it's in a state of decay. So um, actually the solution is don't try and change the way you naturally are. Don't even try and change that. I have natural tendencies. Um, to do things, and they, I'll have to deal with that for the rest of my life. Um, I was raised in a different part of Canada. Things were a little violent where I grew up, and there's things that I have a natural tendency, and I just say, no, that's not an option for the new nature. I have to set this aside. So when somebody uh, does something and I have a natural tendency just to get out and kill them, no, <laughs> I don't do that. And you know what? I'll have to deal with that for the rest of my life because I've noticed that as I grow older, the natural way I am is not improving. I don't try and change it, but I have a choice as a Christian now to set that aside on a daily basis and live a supernatural life. Finally, uh, Vine gets into the real question here, is gay sex an abomination? Not the real question, but it's, it's lying throughout his book because he has to deal with this at some point. And he mentions some of the relevant passages. Here's one in case you haven't seen it before. If there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them committed a detestable act, they shall surely be put to death. And you'll note, if you go to Leviticus, there's other sexual prohibitions as well, in the same context even, right in the same chapter, in, in uh, a few chapters earlier. Incest, no incest, no adultery, no sex during menstruation, no sex with animals. So it's not uh, just a standalone thing. It occurs within a context of describing sexual moral behavior. Now, Vine points out, though, that other things refer to, to as toba, abominations and detestable acts in Leviticus, that Christians have no problem with today. For example, charging interest, eating pork, and menstrual sex. And I will confess that at lunch I had pizza, and I noticed there was bacon on this pizza, <laughs> and I ate it. And I don't have a problem with that. Uh, so he's saying, if you don't have a problem with this, and it was described with the same Hebrew word, why do you have a problem with that? So v v Vines argues that the real reason the real reason that same-sex relations were prohibited back then was because it was a violation of the patriarchal system. For example, he points out to an example that's uh, some 1,300 years later. Uh, Pl Pl Philo wrote of the affliction of being treated like a woman, and he is saying that same-sex relationships, one of the men physically has to sort of take the role of the woman in that same-sex relationship. And he says that's the real reason, is that one of the men, back then, patriarchy was important. It was a violation of that. And that's why they said, don't do this. So Vine summarizes it by saying this. None of these considerations lend support to the idea that the Leviticus verses are grounded in a commitment to anatomical complementarity. Fancy word for it, naked man, naked woman, look at the two. And you'll notice that they seem to be designed, actually, for sexual relationships. They're compatible. They complement one another. But he's saying, don't, that's not the reason, he's saying. It has nothing to do with that. He's saying the reason, the concern, is instead centered on the proper order of gender roles in a patriarchal society. That understanding sheds light on why Leviticus contains no parallel prohibition of female sex relations. Now, you do see one in, in, um, in Romans, but not in Leviticus. So Vine's argument could be summarized as follows. The reason same-sex relations were condemned in Leviticus is that they violated the patriarchal view that women were inferior to men. This patriarchal view has been abandoned by Christians today. Therefore, Christians no longer have a reason for believing same-sex relations are still an abomination. 
Now, whenever you see a syllogism, if you're a little concerned, if you have red flags, uh, it's not good enough to say I got red flags. You've got to look at the proposition and say which one uh, doesn't seem quite right here. And I have a problem with this word right here, the reason. So I would say that my response is kind of a multifaceted one here. But I'd say, first of all, he's reading in an exception extrapolated from single snapshots taken from other cultures to neutralize what appears to be a clear description of when we read it, we figure, I, I can see what he's describing here. And what he's saying is, well, no, there's other stuff you need to know about ancient civilizations over the next or several thousand years. And there's reasons you can derive from that, when you, and, that's, and those are the reasons why you're not supposed to do that. The text simply describes same-sex intimacy with no exceptions. This is one of my responses, one of the things I would say. It doesn't seem to say, it does not add, for example, except if the sexual relations occur within a committed, loving, covenantal marriage. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that for incest, uh, animals, and, and those are two examples people are fighting for legal rights for now. There was an example last year uh, where a, a father and his daughter are fighting to have a legally recognized marriage. That's incest, but they would argue it's a loving, committed relationship, and so forth. There is another person here in Ontario um, in a reputable institution who uh, is quite open about her. She's, uh, her orientation is, tra is um, um, how would you describe She's zoophil She's zoophilic. That is, when you have a sexual orientation towards another species. And she's fighting for that and, and actually involved in at an academic level for that. So uh, is that the case? Is it okay to have relations with, uh, with her animals if it's a loving, committed, and so forth? It doesn't say, it doesn't add these things. It doesn't say this is, don't do this unless it's that. But here's what I think is the most important thing to think about of all, this last point here. And this is a philosophical approach that I take to the scriptures, but I see that it's it seems to be supported in the scriptures, and that is that obeying God's commands is not contingent upon first figuring out what the reasons for the command might be, and then deciding to obey or not, assuming you've concluded the right reasons. Now, there is a role to figure out when you're, trans when you're translating from ancient Hebrew into English or whatever language, yeah, it, it really does help to have a good knowledge of what these words mean, what the context they were used. Do you have other documents that use? So there's, there, is a, there is a role for figuring out what the word means when you're doing the translation. But once that's all done, and he simply says, don't do this, what I'm about to describe, and then he describes something, and it seems to be fairly clear and graphic, well, then you just don't do it, even if you don't understand the reasons. And the reason for that, I suggest, is twofold. Number one, God says, to those, by those who draw near to me, I'll be treated as holy. You don't just have a casual attitude to what he asks you to do. Nadab and Abihu would be an example. And the second thing is, is that uh, in one of my philosophy grad seminars in um, Theories of Morality, uh, this idea that I presented to the class, that in fact, uh, one of the problems with human-based morality is that it doesn't see the future consequences of present-day actions. So there may be laws that are given to us that in the present seem to deprive us of happiness, but long-term may actually uh, spare us from pain and suffering and promote happiness long term and this uh, and the whole sexual morality thing might be part of that so it appears to be part of a transcendent moral law and this is why we obey some parts in the Old Testament and not the others and that is that there are many laws in the Levitical Covenant that were superseded by the New Covenant and it's quite explicit about that but there's a transcendent moral law that seems to be applied to all people all places and all time like for example no murdering and so just because no murdering is included in the Levitical law doesn't mean we can now abandon that and I can fully pursue my natural tendencies. Not at all. Is that, wouldn't it be surprising if the law given at Mount Sinai did not include the universal moral law? That would be surprising. Of course, we would expect the universal moral law to be included within that, Levit that Levitical law given there. So one of the keys to figure out what's part of the universal moral law is, is it true before, during, and after? For example, was it true before the law? Is it true after the law? So in the New Testament, you see that the sexual moral laws are repeated again, and even in more detail, and sometimes the bar is raised higher. So that it's not good enough just to not climb into bed with my neighbor's wife. I can't even lust after her in the New Testament. Otherwise, I've done that. 
it's not good enough just to not kill the guy who, you know, beat up that little kid over there. I can't even hate him. I have to have, I love him. I have to love him as I love my own self. So, um, Romans 1, does, I have no idea what time I got yet, so I'm, okay. Uh, Matthew Vine says, Romans 1, I'm really apologize. I normally take an hour and a half to do this, and I'm cut out a lot of arguments. I'm speaking fast, bad form, but let's just move on. This passage is not of central importance to Paul's message in Romans. In fact, he used it only as a brief example to drive home a point he was making about idolatry. Um, I, I personally, and this is my own view of Romans chapter 1, it, provides a ro- it not only provides a starting point, a launch point for the rest of Romans, but it actually provides a roadmap for human civilization. And I think in the final chapters of human civilization, we will actually see this roadmap un- unfolding before our very eyes, and I think we are. And I, I have another talk on how I see Romans 1, the four the various stages unfolding. So I think it's very important. It gives us an enormous insight into the propensities of humanity and some predictive insight as well. So what Vines reads into the text, Paul, um, and I'm quoting Matthew Vines here, explicitly described the behavior he condemned as lustful. He made no mention of love, fidelity, monogamy, or commitment. So in Romans chapter 1, when he talks about men with men and women with women, he talks about lustful passion. He says, note the word lustful passion is used here. So if it's not lustful, it must be okay. Uh, that's, that's a bit of a risky thing there to say, well, this adjective, I'm not going to use this adjective. I'm going to do what it says you're not supposed to do, but I'm not doing it with that adjective, and therefore it's okay. That should be discussed. That should be before you actually go out and do it. But also, it's also risky to say, well, he says don't do this, but he didn't say, and I used this uh, countless times as a kid when my mother would say, don't do this, and I'd say, yes, but you didn't say don't do it while standing on one leg, you know, or whatever. <laughs> so I would put in my own exceptions, and then I would go ahead and do it, and then I'd get caught, and I'd get punished. Uh, Vines writes, we have to remember that what Paul is describing is fundamentally different from what we're discussing. That is, he's describing, um, he's not describing sexual orientation as his main point. Paul wasn't condemning the expression of a same-sex orientation as opposed to the expression of an opposite set orientation. He was condemning excess as opposed to moderation. So what he's saying is when you look at this passage, what it really means is that you shouldn't do this stuff excessively or lustfully. But if you don't do it excessively or lustfully, then it's okay to do. In fact, it's not only okay to do, but he suggests we affirm it. The context in which Paul discussed same-sex relations differs so much from our own, it can't reasonably be called the same issue. His argument is summarized as follows. None of the reasons for Paul's negative statements about same-sex behavior, quote, extends to the loving, committed relationships of gay Christians today. If one is true, then Romans 1 has nothing to do with loving, committed relationships of gay Christians today. Therefore, Romans 1 has nothing to do with loving, committed relationships of gay Christians today. Um, Here's my response. He's reading into the text. He's reading things into it in order to exclude what he wants it to exclude. I also observe that all the texts in the Bible, all of them, bar none, that describe same-sex relationships prohibited in strong language, using words like abomination in English, abomination, detestable, degrading in Romans, no exceptions for loving covenantal relationships are ever stated in the scriptures. For incest, same-sex relationships, sex with animals, no exceptions. Final thoughts? Um... It was the Holy Spirit who inspired scripture for all people, all places, and all times, so the writers were not limited by ancient contemporary thought or knowledge, at least when it came to sexual moral rules. And if there are limitations there, uh, you'll see them. This is, again, we can talk about hermeneutics, um, different theories of biblical interpretation, but there are things where it does help to know and uh, to get the right idea. And if that is the case, then uh, my, my presupposition is it should be included. You won't get a thorough, detailed knowledge of something, but there should be enough information in the scriptures so that the 99.9% of people throughout history who don't have the benefit of a massive library and a seminary education uh, won't be uh, misled when they're reading the scriptures. It should be written in such a way that they're going to get the general idea. And one of my uh, uh, philosophical presuppositions when I read the commands is that the command should be clear enough for that a child can understand them, but if you want to understand why, the rationale may take you the rest of your life in multiple PhDs. <laughs>
Neither the Leviticus passage nor the Romans passage adds any qualifiers or exceptions and must be taken as applying to homosexual acts generally across the board. Celibacy is not limited to a gift that is chosen. Singles are often single for life. They did not choose it. They endure it, but they endure it because they love God and they love to live a life that is holy. There are numerous passages in the Bible that make it clear that we're, we should not just assume we have no problem sexual, with our sexuality. And uh, affirming gay marriage requires reinterpreting every relevant scripture, redefining terms, restricting the meanings of terms, arguing from silence, and arguing from the assumption that the Bible was written by men, limited by knowledge at the time, when it was giving theological and moral rules, uh, rather than men moved by the Holy Spirit. And notes are there. I think I'm done. Is my time up? Yep. Okay.